Good morning everyone, we are the Three Sisters in a Wedding and today we're going to report Unit 1 which is the basics of surveying with the three subtopics namely surveying concepts, accuracy of measurements, and measurement of distances. So kindly take down notes and listen well because we'll be having key activity in the last part of this reporting. So sit back and relax. Good day, I'm Kathleen O'Dugan, and I'm going to talk about the concepts, the uses, and the types of surveys. Surveying can also be defined as a branch of applied mathematics that teaches the art of determining the area of any portion of the Earth's surface. It measures the horizontal and vertical distance between objects and angles between lines which also determine the direction of lines. Surveying has the art of estimating points by predetermined angular and linear measurements. For the types of survey, we have the first one, plane surveying. A sort of survey in which the land is treated as a flat surface and a distance in regions covered are so little that the actual shape of the soil is neglected. Geodetic surveying calculates the exact location of permanent points on the Earth's surface, taking into account the shape, size, and curvature of the planet. These are frequently conducted on a national scale. The majority of these are done by government entities to provide a foundation for producing accurate base and topographic maps. Cadastral surveys are usually closed surveys that are carried out in both urban and rural regions to determine and define property lines and boundaries, corners, and areas. City surveys are conducted on areas within and around a city for the purposes of planning expansions or improvements, establishing property lines, erecting reference monuments, determining the physical features and configuration of the land, and generating maps. Engineers, architects, and builders use construction surveys to gather information about grades, reference lines, dimension, ground shape, and the location and elevation of structures. Forestry surveys are a sort of stream survey used in forest management and measurement, as well as the production and conservation of forest lands. Streams, lakes, reservoirs, harbors, oceans, and other bodies of water are all subject to hydrographic surveys. These surveys are used to map shorelines, track the geometry of places beneath water's surface, and monitor stream flow. Optical tooling is another term for industrial surveys. Surveying techniques are used in shipbuilding, aircraft construction and assembly, and the designing and installation of large and complicated machinery. Mine surveys reveal the location of all underground excavations and mine structures, as well as the surface borders of mining claims, geological formations, excavated volumes, and lines and grades for additional mining activity. In photogrammetric surveys, photographs collected with specially developed cameras from airplanes or ground stations are used. Route surveys involves the planning, design, and building of highways, railroads, pipelines, canals, transmission lines, and other linear projects, as well as the determination of alignment, gradients, earthwork quantities, and the location of natural and artificial features. In topographic surveys, natural and artificial features such as hills, mountains, rivers, lakes, and relief of the ground surface are depicted to determine the contour of the ground and the location and height of these features. Surveying has many uses, such as staking out of simple structures, 
Setting out or staking out is the process of transferring dimensions from the layout plan to the ground, from the construction design to the real site. It is also for small parcels of land. A parcel of land is a piece of land that is intended to be sold as a whole and not divided into smaller pieces. Next is for extensive surveys and construction of subdivisions, dams, bridges, railroads, highways, pier, canals, missile and rocket launching sites, drainage, and irrigation systems. Next is the laying out of industrial equipment. Surveying also helps in preparing forestry and geological maps. Forestry helps to preserve forests using sustainable methods in line with conservation policies. It also helps in positioning massive and complex machinery for construction of ships and airplanes. And lastly, surveying is used for exploration of extraterrestrial bodies. Good day everyone, I'm Gender Compassion and we will talk about survey instrumentation, care and handling of instruments, surveying field notes, and the field survey party. Under surveying instrumentation, we have automatic level. An optical instrument used to establish or verify points in the same horizontal plane in a process known as leveling and is used in conjunction with the leveling staff to establish the relative heights, levels of objects or marks. It is widely used in surveying and construction to measure height differences and to transfer, measure, and set heights of known objects or marks. To set up automatic level, we will need to fully extend the tripod legs and mount the instrument on the tripod head. Next is to move the instrument to a convenient location and spread the tripod legs evenly apart, keeping the tripod head nearly level, and then plant all three tripod legs firmly into the ground. For cursed leveling, adjust the leg lengths to move the level bubble partially into the circle. For fine leveling, center the bubble by adjusting the leveling screws using the left thumb rule. When the level bubble is centered, turn the instrument 90 degrees and ensure that the bubble returns to the circle. Now, we can point the instrument toward your first rod reading. Use the aiming sight and the slow motion screw for fine adjustments. We can adjust the instrument focus on the rod using the objective focus knob. Also, we can adjust the eyepiece focus by turning the ring surrounding the eyepiece. After all measurements are complete and before removing the instrument from the tripod, return the leveling screws to their centered positions. Next is Engineer's Transit. It is similar to builder's levels. When it's locked into place, it works almost exactly like a builder's level. Their main difference is that when a transit level is not locked into place, it can tilt only vertically and has a very limited range of mobility. Transit levels has vertical movement mechanism that are great tools for measuring vertical angles. It is also preferred over other leveling tools for establishing straight lines as well as turning angles. A theodolite, a precision instrument used for measuring angles both horizontally and vertically. Theodolites can rotate along the horizontal axis as, as well as their vertical axis. Theodolites used in closed graduated circles and angular readings are taken using an internal magnifying optical system. Theodolites tend to have a more precise reading and provide greater accuracy in measuring angles than transits do. The Total Station An electronic transit theodolite integrated with electronic distance measurement or EDM to measure both vertical and horizontal angles and the slope distance from the instrument to a particular point and an onboard computer to collect data and perform triangulation calculations. Other instruments and tools used in surveying are steel tape, range finder, plumb bob, leveling rod, range poles, and marking pins. To take good care and handle the instrument properly, we will always remember that the level should always be kept in a box when it is not used. 
It should remain in its carrying case when transported to the work site or when it has to be moved to another distant setup or over rough terrain. The level does not have to be detached from the tripod when transferring to another nearby station, provided that it is securely fastened to the tripod and is carried properly. In open spaces, the level may be carried on the shoulder in preferably a near vertical position. The spindle is clamped slightly so that the telescope does not rotate when carried. It must be in full view of the person carrying it to avoid heating into trees and underbrush. In densely forested areas, the level should be cradled between the arms and held to one's left or right chest. The spindle should be unclamped to allow the telescope to turn freely and give away readily to any pressure or possible collision with an object. The Field Notebook The Field Notebook should be good quality rock paper with stiff board or leather cover made to withstand the hard usage and of pocket size. There are different types of notes, the sketches, the tabulations, the explanatory notes, the computations, and the combination of all. The field survey part. Before any work begins on a job site, a survey party must first establish the legal boundaries of the land upon which the work will be done. It is comprises of the following. Chief of party. The person who is responsible for the overall direction, supervision, and the operational control of the survey party. Assistant Chief of Party He or she assists the Chief of Party in the accomplishment of the task assigned to the survey party. Instrument Man The person who sets up, level, and operates surveying instruments such as the transit, engineer's level, theodolite, plane table, and alidade, and etc. Technician Responsible for use and operation of all electronic instruments required in a field work operation. Computer The person who performs all computations of survey data and works out necessary computational checks required in a field work operation. Recorder is the person who keeps a record of all sketches, drawings, measurements, and observations taken or needed for a field work operation. Head Tapeman The person responsible for the accuracy and speed of all linear measurements with tape. Rear Tapeman The person who assists the head tapeman during taping operations and in other related work. Flagman The person holding the flagpole or range pole at selected points as directed by the instrument man during operation. Radman. Primary duty is to hold the stage or leveling rod when sights are to be taken on it. Pacer is the person who checks all linear measurements made by the tape man. Axeman or lineman. Its duty is to clear the line of sight of trees, bush, and other obstructions in wooden country. Aidman. The person who renders first aid treatment to members of the survey party who are involved in cases involving health, safety, and well-being. Utility men, the persons whose duties are to render other forms of assistance needed by the survey party. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Joy Iamoven, and I'll be presenting to you the second subtopic, which is the accuracy of measurement. So starting with, what is a measurement? So it is defined as the method of identifying a quantity's dimension in relation to a given standard. So here in surveying, we'll be dealing with angles, elevations, times, lines, areas, and also volumes. So measurements in surveying may be direct or indirect. Direct in a way that there's a comparison of the measured quantity to a standard measuring units used for measuring that type of quantity. So an example for this is determining a horizontal or vertical angle using a transit. And it could also be determining the intersection angle by aligning or using a protractor between two intersecting lines. In opposite, there's also what we call as the indirect measurement. So the identified value is determined by its correlation to other values that are unknown. So let's say you wanted to find out something that is a little harder to measure, like how quickly the wind is blowing. So you might 
not be able to measure the wind's actual speed, but if you had an instrument or a windmill, you could measure how much power the windmill is making. So using this information, you could work backwards to figure out how fast the wind must be. So this would be an example where you have to measure something indirectly. So these indirect measurements are also known or is known as comparative measurement due to the fact that the comparison is performed using an object with the standard dimensions. Next is the unit of measurement. So we use the International System Unit or the SI where meter is used for linear measurement, square meter for areas, cubic meter for volume, and radian for angles. So we should also be familiar with the prefixes that can be added when using the SI, linear measurements that are based upon the meters. So like for example, these common units for length, the millimeter, the centimeter, meter, and kilometer. For the area, the unit in SI is the square meter. So one hectare is equal to 10,000 square meters, one acre is equal to 100 square meters, and one square kilometers square kilometer is equal to 1 million square meters which is also equal to 100 hectares so for the common uh, metric units for volume it is the following the cubic meter liter and also milliliter or the ml so for the um, angular measurements SI unit for angles is radian which is an angle formed by an arc of a circle with a length equal to the circle's radius so 2 pi rad is equal to 360 degrees followed by the sexagesimal unit which is an english system of units that is used in measuring trigonometric angles so i think we're familiar with this um here in the philippines this is used together with si for our practical importance and familiarity right so this is through degree minute and also second so lastly the centesimal unit which is the french equivalent system of the success decimal so instead of degree um this system uses grade and so on with the minute and second so an example for this is like when a circle is divided into 400 grads where each part is called one grade moving on a difference between two or more measured values of the same quantity is defined as a discrepancy. However, no matter what survey instrument or method is used, measurements are never exact and there will always be some degree of variation. So these variations are referred to as errors or mistakes. So errors are caused by misunderstanding of the problem, inexperience, and indifference of the surveyor, while mistakes or something that you didn't know while reading the wrong graduation of the tape. So there are two types of errors. The first one is the systematic. So these errors will have the same magnitude and direction under the same measurement conditions. So it might be positive or negative. So this is caused by the surveying equipment, observation methods, and certain environmental factors. So how to correct a systematic errors? So we need two apply corrections, we need to use proper ways in handling the instruments, and also we need to adopt a field procedure. So the second type of error is the accidental error. So these are caused by factors which is beyond the surveyor's control and are present in all surveying measurements. So there are sources, different sources of errors. There are three. So first one is the instrumental. So this is caused by surveying instruments that are not properly constructed, adjusted, or calibrated. Next one is the natural error. So these are caused by environmental conditions or when there is a change in the happenings of nature. So an example for this is wind speed, air temperature, atmospheric pressure, humidity, gravity, earth curvature, and the atmospheric refraction. And lastly, which is the personal or the human error. So this is caused by physical limitations and inconsistent setup and observation habits of the surveyor. Let's now proceed to accuracy and precision. So these two are different yet similarly significant surveying concepts. Accuracy is the level of conformity of a given measurement with a standard value, while precision is the extent to which a given set of measurements concur with their mean. So I'll be showing you 
the difference between accuracy and precision. So here I presented four figures. So figure A shows good precision but poor accuracy. As you can see, the holes are very near to each other yet very far from the target in the middle. While figure B shows poor precision but good accuracy. So although they are far from each other, we chose the poor position, but they are near to the middle which it shows good accuracy. And figure C shows good precision and good accuracy. It's very visible. And figure D shows poor precision and poor accuracy. It's very observable also. So now we'll go on with the theory of probability. So as probability deals with the number of times an event will happen over the range of occurrences that are possible to happen, so this theory is concerned with the study of random events which is based on assumptions correlated with the occurrences of errors. So under this is the most probable value or what we call as the MPV, which is about the accessible quantity which has a greater number of chances of being correct compared to any other. So this MPV is determined by this equation which I think all of us is very familiar with. The X bar or the bar X is, yes it's correct, the mean. So using the equation, um, we can try answering this one. So a surveying instructor sent out six groups of students to measure a distance between two points marked on the ground. The students came up with the following six different values to 50.25, to 50.15, to 49.90, to 51.04, to 50.50, and to 51.22 meters. So assuming these values are equally reli reliable and that our variations result from accidental errors, determine the most probable value of the distance measured. So just using the MPV equation, we can have solution like this. So, um, adding all the values given and dividing by how many number it has, so 6, so the answer would be 250.51 meters. Now, we'll also be tackling about relative precision. So, this gives relation to the magnitude of the measured quantity from a measurement to give accuracy. So, under this one is what we call as the probable error. So, this gives a range with 50% chance that the value of the measured quantity lies inside or outside the limits when being added or subtracted from the MPV. So these are the following equations you need to be familiarized with because we'll be using it later on. So there's an illustrative problem. So the following values were determined in a series of tape measurements of a line. So we need to determine the following. First one is the MPV of the measured length. So with a given n is equal to 6 where n is the number of measurements of the line, we also would need to um, add everything, the measurements of the line, which is equal to 6,002.70 meters. And we can get MPV by um, dividing the summation of the measurements of the line by the number of the measurements of the line, which is 6. So the MPV would be 1,000.45 meters. So next one is the probable error of a single measurement and the probable error of the mean. So first one, first thing we should do is to find V, where V is the residual. So we can get V by subtracting the MPV from the each of the given uh, measurement. So here you can see V1 until V6. Then we need to um, square it, the square of the residual or the V squared which is also 6, then we need to get the summation of the square of the residual, which is the sum summation of v squared. So we can get 0 .0 0 0.0278. So the probable error of any single measurement would be plus minus 0 0.6745 times the square root of summation of the residual over n minus 1. So sub substituting everything, so you could get plus minus 0 0.05 meters, so that is the probable error of a single measurement. Then for the probable error of the mean, we should um, use the equation plus minus 0 0.6745 times the square root of summation of the square of residual over n times n minus 1. So substituting everything, you would get 1 plus 
at plus minus 0.02 meters so that is the probable error of the mean so don't worry guys i'll be handling you these slides so next is the final expression for the most probable length so this we can get this by um, adding the MPV and the probable error of the mean which is 1,045 meters plus minus 0.02 so therefore the length of the measured line may be expressed as 1,045 meters plus minus 0.02 meters so this means that there is a 50% chance that the true distance measured probably falls between 1,043 meters and 1,047 meters and that is its most probable value is 1,045 meters. But there is also, however, a 50% chance that the true distance lies outside the range. Next one is the relative precision of the measurement, which can be um, get by dividing probable error of the mean by the most probable value of the measurement. So we will have two relative precision. First one is the single measurement. So 0.05 which is the probable error of the mean over the most probable value of the measurement so 1000.45 so that would be the rps or any single measurement would be 1 over 20,000 so if you're asking if this could be um, expressed in decimal that could also be i think but we are using a um, fraction that is because the answer for that is too small so it's better that we will um, express this in two fractions. The next is the relative precision of the mean. So 0 0.02 which is the probable error over 1000.45 and that is 1 over 58,000. So one tip for this so that um, you can get, um, you will not be lost along the way is to have a tabulated results of it. Lastly is the weighted observation, which is the measure of an observation's relative worth compared to other observations. So this is also the assessed level of dependability for every measurement before they are combined and most probable values are determined. So we can try solving this one. So there are four measurements of a distance recorded as 284.80, 284.19, 284.22, and 284.20 meters and given weights are 1, 3, 2, and 4 respectively so we need to determine the weighted mean so as what I said earlier it's better if we have tabulated results so we listed all the measured length which is the following 284.18 and so on and the assigned weight which is 1, 3, 2, and 4 respectively and we need to uh, multiply that one so that is p so again 284.18 times 1 that is 284.18 284.19 times 3 that is 852.57 and so on so we need to um sum everything up and that would give us 208 2841.99 and since we are looking for the weighted mean so we need to divide it by the number of um weights which is 10 summation of 10 the summation of the weights is 10 so 1 plus 3 plus 2 plus 4 is equal to 10 so lastly or in conclusion so the weighted mean would be 284.20 meters so this is the most probable value of the distance measured this is Raisa we'll be reporting unit 1.3 in 1.3 we have methods of distance measurement Measurement of distance is the distance between two points, point A and point B on a plane. Now what is distance measurement in surveying? If we say that we want to measure the horizontal distance between two points, then that is what we call plane survey. If points A and B are at different elevations, then the distance is the horizontal length between the plumb lines at the points. In determining the distance, we have several methods that we can use. We have facing, photogrammetry, taping, documentary, mechanical, mathematical, graphical, and electronic distance measurement. First off, we have facing. It is measuring the area through counting the number of steps from point A to point B. It is necessary to first determine the pace factor of the individual whose pace will be used as reference. 
Pace factor is the length of one's pace. It must be done by calibrating one's natural straight walk. A pedometer or pasometer are advised when pacing long distances. As represented here in the photo, here we have footprints. If we do toe-to-toe, -to -toe, then that is considered as one pace. Two paces is considered as one stride. Photogrammetry refers to measurement of images on a photograph. It is the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images and patterns of electromagnetic radiant imagery. Next, we have taping. Tapes are used in surveying to measure horizontal, vertical, and slope distances. When using the tape method, it's not the fastest and most accurate method for measuring distances due to many factors that could affect the accuracy of results. In the latter part, we will dive deeper into taping and discuss the common errors and mistakes in taping, procedure of taping, tape correction due to pull, tape correction due to temperature, and so on. Next is tachymetry. Tachymetry is a branch of angular surveying, which means that the horizontal and vertical distances of points are obtained by optical means. The method can be done rapidly and is convenient. Tachymetry measurements has two methods, stadium method and the subtense par method. For stadium method, it is a rapid mean of determining horizontal distances. This method uses trigonometry to approximately measure the distance between the stadia and the rod. In the photo, we can see that we have here stadia hairs. These are vertical cross hairs. These are referred to as the upper reading and the lower reading. And the middle is the level cross hair. The left side is the telescope. Meanwhile, on the right side, that is the stadia rod. The stadia rod is where we will base our measurements with the upper reading, lower reading, and the level cross here, which is the average or the middle. One does decide to use the stadia method. Here we have the formula for computation. D is equal to K times S plus C. C is the stadia constant, and K is the stadia interval factor of the instrument. S is stadia interval, the difference between the upper and the lower stadia here reading. Here we have a sample problem for the stadia method. A stadia rod held at a distance point B is sighted by an instrument set up at A. The upper and lower stadia hair reading were observed as 1.300 meters and 0.900 meters respectively. If the stadia interval factor K is 100 and the instrument constant C is 0, determine the length of the line A to B. We then substitute the given values to our formula D is equal to KS plus C. We'll then have 100 multiplied by the difference of 1.3 and 0.9 meters plus its instrument constant 0 that is a total of 40.0 meters. Take note that we multiplied S by 100 since we are using the unit meters. Next up, we have the subtense bar method. It is still a part of the tachymetry method. Subtense bar method is a convenient and practical device used for quick and accurate measurements of horizontal distances. For the formula of subtense bar method, we have d is equal to cotangent alpha over 2. Here on the left side of the photo, we have here a triangle which is cut into half and now leaves us with a right triangle. This is the reason why cotangent is alpha divided by 2. Here we have a sample problem for subtense bar method. A subtense bar 2.0 meters long is set up near the middle of a transverse line PQ. Using a theodolite set up at P, the angle subtended reads 0 degrees 20 minutes 14 seconds. When the theodolite was transferred and set up at Q, the corresponding subtended angle was observed at 0 degrees, 23 minutes, 47 seconds. Determine the horizontal length of the line. Reminder that you must put your calculator in degree mode. With the formula D is equal to cotangent alpha over 2, we will substitute the value that is given. With point P, which is 0 degrees, 20 minutes, and 14 seconds. D is equal to cotangent 20 minutes, 14 seconds divided by 2. That will give us with the result of 339.81 meters. After that, you can proceed by substituting the other given values. 
We are finally done with tachymetry. Now we will proceed to mechanical. For mechanical, these devices are only applicable for low precision surveys where quick measurements are desired. These include odometer, measuring wheel, and optical range finder. For odometer, it is an easy and simple device that can be attached to a wheel for purposes of roughly measuring a surface distance. As you can see here in the photo, there is an odometer that is attached to a measuring wheel. Next, we have the optical range finder. This device can be used to determine approximate distances through focusing. After the mechanical method of measuring distance, we have mathematical and graphical methods. These methods are widely used in plain table surveys and in triangulation works. These methods are often used in inaccessible terrains. You can see here in the photo that this engineer is using a plain table survey. Lastly, we have Electronic Distance Measurement or EDM. In EDM, distances are measured electronically by determining the number of full and partial waves of transmitted electromagnetic energy. Since we were able to discuss all eight methods of determining distances, we will now go back to taping and discuss errors and mistakes in taping, procedures of taping, tape correction due to pull, temperature, sag, and slope, and then combine tape correction. There are six steps in the procedure of taping. One is aligning the tape. When a line is to be measured, both ends must first be marked. It may also be necessary to establish a few intermediate points to serve as guides in obtaining a straight line. Step two is stretching the tape. The steady and firm pull, generally between four and seven kilograms, is applied on one end of the tape during stretching. This is very particular since no measurement should be made without stretching the tape since tapes are correct in length only when a standard pull is applied to it. Third is plumbing. Both ends of the tape should be held above ground, above the level of the waist or the chest, and in a horizontal position. Also, each end of the tape is marked by positioning a plumb line. Fourth is marking full tape lengths. When a full tape length is measured, the rear tape man holds his end of the tape opposite the pin earlier set on the ground. The tape man, after being lined in properly, exerts the required pull on the tape, notes the zero end, and sets a pin beside it. Fifth is tallying tape measurements. At the initial point, the rear tape man holds one pin, and the head tape man begin with 10 pins carried on his steel rings. This is the reason why a set of 11 pins is normally used during taping operations. And lastly, number 6, measuring fractional lengths. When the last segment of the line is to be measured, this will often be a measurement which will consist of a fractional tape length. When we say fractional length, this means that the last segment of the line to be measured is usually not a whole number. That's why from the word fractional, it is a fraction. Moving on to common errors and mistakes in taping. First, we have substandard or nominal length. This means that there are faults or damages on the tape, such as bends, cuts, and slices, and so on. Next, we have end of tape is not held at the same level. Especially when workers are working on an inclined or rough terrain surface, it is not impossible that there would be inconsistency of elevation at the other end of the tape. Next is inaccuracy in keeping the tape along a straight line. Next, tape is not of nominal length due to the difference in the temperature during measurements. The difference in the measurement prevails during the actual measurement, thus giving inconsistent results. Next is the application of pole on the tape. This means that you are either shortening or lengthening the tape due to the application of pole applied on the tape. And lastly, we have effect of sag or strong blowing of side wind. The distance between the endpoints of an unsupported length tape is less than the specified normal length due to the effect of sag or strong blowing of the wind. Thus, you end up with inaccurate results. Next up, we have tape correction. For tape correction, this has different types. We have tape correction due to pull, tape correction due to temperature, tape correction due to sag, and tape correction due to slope. As you can see, pull, temperature, sag, and slope were all mentioned in the errors in taping. Let's start off with number one, that is tape correction due to pull. 
This is during calibration or standardization, a tape is subjected to a certain amount of standard polar tension on its end. Since the modulus of elasticity of a material can be expressed in the ratio of unit stress to unit elongation, then we have here E is equal to unit stress over elongation per unit length. Then when we have the total elongation, we can then find the corrected length of the measured line, which has the equation of corrected length of the measured line is equal to measured length of the line plus minus total elongation. Number two, we have tape correction due to temperature. The correction applied to the length of the tape due to the change in temperature C sub T. Thus, C sub T is equal to the product of C, L, and the difference of T and C sub S. C is the coefficient of linear expansion. L is the length of the tape or length of line measured. T is the observed temperature of the tape at the time of the measurement. And T sub S is the temperature at which the tape was standardized. For number 3, we have tape correction due to sag. We have the formula C sub S is equal to W squared multiplied by L divided by 24 multiplied by P squared. The tape forms an arc due to the lack of support. Thus, we correct the arc formed by the tape in the subtending cord using the formula Capital W is the total weight of the tape between supports. P is tension or pull applied on the tape. And then we have tape correction due to slope. Given the formula C sub H is equal to H squared over the sum of S plus B. For the first three topics, we tackle about the concept of surveying wherein it tells us how it measures horizontal and vertical distance between objects, angles between lines, and direction of lines. The different uses were also explained, giving us realizations that this method is not only for building houses, but also for industrial and environmental purposes. And lastly, are the 11 types of surveying, namely the plane, Geodetic, Cadastral, City, Construction, Forestry, Hydrography, Industrial, Mine, Photogrammetric, and Route. We discussed about the different surveying instruments, specifically about the automatic level, engineer's transit, theodolite, total station, and other instruments and tools. Also, we are already aware on how to take good care and handle them. In addition, we came to understand the importance and the types of surveying field notes. And on the last part, we discussed about the field survey party and their respective roles or duties. For the subtopic 2, which is the accuracy of measurements, we were able to compare direct and indirect measurements, discuss the unit of measurements, differentiate errors and mistakes, as well as accuracy and precision. And this is very important, especially for the surveyors to possess this kind of skill in instrument operation and knowledge of surveying methods to minimize the amount of error in each measurement. And we also tried solving the MPV or the most probable value, the probable error, the relative precision, and the weighted measurements. In Unit 1.3, we learned about the distance measurement in surveying and we were also able to distinguish the different methods used in determining the distances. It can be abbreviated as PPTTMMGE, which stands for Pacing, Photogrammetry, Taping, Tachymetry, Mechanical, Mathematical, and Graphical Methods, and EDM, which is Electronic Distance Measurement. In the latter part of the report of distance measurement, we tackled taping in particular to address how it should be done, the common errors that may occur when performing it, and then the different tape correction formulas for those errors such as due to pull, due to temperature, sag, and slope. This ends our report for Unit 1. Thank you so much for lending us your attention. So that's it guys, I hope you learned many things from our report for Unit 1 and if you have questions and clarifications, you may ask right now.